Welcome to this uh, PCR webinar dedicated to the <coughs> consistency of coronary intravascular lithotripsy across calcium types, genders, and over time. My name is uh, uh, Emanuele Barbato from the Cardiovascular Center Alst in Belgium and from the University Federico II in Italy. Uh, this afternoon, um, I'll try to address with you uh, some of these uh, learning objectives. If you can have the first slide, please. So we are here to uh, discuss and understand in-depth mechanisms of action of intravascular lithotripsy in order to optimally apply this uh, technique. Secondly, we aim at learning about the most suitable indications to IVL in order to optimize clinical outcomes when treating different types of calcified lesions. Thirdly, we would like to appraise the longest term clinical outcome data of coronary intravascular lithotripsy from the DISRAPCA3 trial. And last but not least, we aim at highlighting the most recent OCT data analysis from the DISRAPCA trial series to discuss the efficacy of IVL in eccentric versus concentric calcified lesion. Uh, we have uh, an outstanding panel of expert operators and uh, out, uh, excellent speakers. Let me just introduce you uh, to uh, Margaret McEntegert and uh, Javier Scanet, who are connected from their respective countries. They couldn't make it today to be with us in uh, Paris. And here with me, Flavio Ribichini from the University of Verona. A special thank to Flavio. Why? Because not just because he made it and he is with me here in Paris, but also because he selected a very interesting case, which will be the core business of our discussion today. I'll hand over the word to you, Flavio, and please, let's start with the video. Thank you. Thank you, Emanuele. Hello, everybody. It's a good way to start with a practical case. We did one year ago in May 2020 in the peak of the pandemics in Verona with my friend and colleague Gabriele Pesarini. It's a relatively young lady, 66, diabetic, obese, hypertensive, who came with chest pain at rest with some changes at the ACG in the anterior wall and a minimum spot of troponine. You see that the, ACE, the, the echo is not very good because she's overweight, but it's enough to understand that the contractility is normal and there are no segmental abnormalities either. Uh, she did a coronary angiogram. We found a single vessel disease of the LAD, so we decided to go uh, with PCI after a discussion in the heart team. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, an interventional procedure performed from the right radial artery with a six fringe axis, an ABU 3.5 guiding catheter. And the image shows you immediately which is the problem. It's this uh, shaggy image, uh, radiolucent at the proximal part of the LED with a good distal vessel and some bifurcations. Thank you very much, uh, Flavio, for this introduction. It's a nice kickoff. <coughs> Why don't we display the first question? Uh, please uh, be encouraged to interact with us via the chat box, and uh, you will see appearing, popping up at a certain point in time in this webinar, key questions to you. So what would be your procedural strategy in these patients? You heard the history, you saw this little frame of coronary angiogram. Do you think this image is a thrombus or a, cal a calcified lesion on the prox LED? or would you need additional information before moving further? While you take your time to reflect upon this question, I'd like to hear the comment from uh, Margaret and Javier. Margaret, what are your thoughts? Thanks, Emanuele, and great case. Um, so I agree with uh, Flavio's plan to treat this lesion with PCI. It's a single lesion uh, in a relatively young patient. Um, I think that angiographically, I'd be very suspicious that this is a calcific lesion because even on the angiogram, before the contrast injection, we can see calcium in the vessel wall. So my plan here would be to try and image this lesion up front if possible. It looks quite severe, so that might not be possible, but that would be my plan to try and further assess the calcium burden. Javier, what is your thought? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. From uh, uh, on top of what uh, Margaret has uh, mentioned, obviously sometimes the clinical uh, the clinical scenario gives also an additional hint on whether you may have a thrombus or not. Uh, I think that you have to be more careful if the patient is extremely obese, for example. I mean, sometimes you may have difficulties in looking to calcium. But uh, we fully agree that the next step in this particular lesion in order to prepare it and to plan it will be to perform intracoronary imaging. That's uh, very well said, by the way. We already have uh, comments from our colleagues. Ahmed is uh, mentioning that, according to him, looks like a thrombus. Margaret made your comment on this, but you see 
colleagues uh, are uh, still doubtful. Uh, Ali, he says that is calcium. Uh, so I think we need to know more, Flavio. If you can go on with the video and tell us what you did next. We go immediately. This is the first thing to guess what is inside the artery. And if you suspect it's calcium, you should go with intravascular imaging. This is the Eagle Eye uh, Philips uh, Ivus catheter after crossing with your workhorse wire. My preference it's uh, the old Pilot 50, but of course now you have better or more, more modern, not better wires. You see the, the Ivus catheter from Philips has a very good pushability. It's not low profile, but has good possibility. And as we suspected, it did not cross the proximal part of the LED, confirming that it is a brick of calcium in front of it. That's, uh, that's a, a good point, uh, Flavio. And now what, what are we doing? Uh, let me go back to Margaret and tease her a little bit. Ivos did not make it. Perhaps it's in his hands that did not make it. I'm sure in your hands would make it to cross. Uh, what would you do next, uh, Margaret? Okay, so we have two options here. One is um, we try and probe the lesion with a balloon to see if we can cross with a balloon, which might be possible because we know the eagle eye has a slightly bigger profile um, compared to the other eyeless catheters. Um, so that's one option. And then obviously your other option is you think it's uncrossable, you assume it's balloon uncrossable and you use a microcatheter and you consider a rotational atherectomy. But we haven't really tested yet to see if it's balloon uncrossable, so I would test it with a balloon. That's a good point. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Javier, uh, it is a common belief that if Ivo's catheter doesn't cross, it's per se a radiant indication to more advanced plaque modification technique. What would you be uh, your practice in this case? Yes, I think that, you know, perhaps the skeptic will say it's a very hard thrombus. <laughs> but my impression at this particular point is that uh, what you have already uh, pro probed with the Ivo's catheter is that you have a lot of calcium ahead. That in itself will guide you what to do next. I agree with Margaret. But you could also image at that particular point. We don't, don't lose the, you know, the, the, the chance of imaging and bringing it back because we'll give you additional information on what are the neighbor segments. That's, uh, these are all great suggestions. Let me add one more suggestion from our colleague here who says, do non-compliant balloon, Flavio, and then rotational atherectomy. That is his suggestion. Let's, uh, let's see what you did in the, in the video. Let's go back to the video. Yeah, the balloon is the first step to, to do something because the, the IVUS is not crossing. We want to see what is there. And so the balloon is the option to test the plaque. If the balloon opens a little bit, you will be able to do anything, rotational atherectomy or IVUS. And as you see, a 2.5 semi-compliant balloon open up. And then we upgrade with a 3.5 non-compliant and it opened up. So in a certain way, we created a lumen uh, inside the lumen. So we enlarge and now you can see angiographically the image looks even worse, it, more, more scaring. But now we know that there is diameter enough to cross. If the balloon does not pass, then you think about rotational atherectomy. But we have a 0.14 wire, we went with the balloon, and now the IVUS tell us what is the problem. It's a huge calcific plaque, totally asymmetric on the left side of the, of the image, with a huge amount of calcium. But now we have a lumen, so the next step is to decide how to continue. And you can continue with balloon-based technologies because you, can, you could cross with a 3.5 non-compliant and with the IVUS prop. This is the core registration show that there are two important side branches, two diagonal branches. The distal one is after the plaque. The, the first one is just in the middle of the calcified plaque. Thank you very much uh, for this additional piece of information. Why don't we display the next question to our colleagues? Uh, please reflect on this, uh, in this point. Now we've got our intravascular imaging. Many of you in the chat <coughs> box have asked for it. Now we got it. Uh, what do we do with that? Because we have to be consistent. Now we are learning something from imaging. Do you think that with, with the level of plaque modification achieved thus far, we are ready for stenting or do we need something more? While I let you reflecting on this question, I'd like to ask the uh, first the opinion of Javier. Are you happy with this uh, plaque modification achieved so far? Would you do more? Would you stent? 
No, well, first, I mean, I must say, I, you know, I, I was uh, surprised when I see how eccentric this uh, calcific plaque is. You know, I, 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 I guess, my, my guess was that there would be lots of calcium, but I could not imagine it was so eccentric. Uh, and of course, you have to really uh, deal with this uh, large uh, amount of, uh, of calcium because as, as Flavio has highlighted, it's more than 180 degrees in some areas and you really have to modify this calcium <clears throat> to get the expansion. Margaret, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think this is one of these lesions you have to be very cautious about because the balloon looks like it expands. I bet you if we came caudal, the expansion would be eccentric. Um, and I think you could be fooled into proceeding to stenting here and end up with a very under-expanded stent. So I think we need to go on and do some further calcium modification. Uh, Javier, uh, I think there is quite of a consensus here that we are not just uh, in ready to do stenting. We need something more. In addition, what we learned from Ivos is that there is a, an important degree of eccentric plaque uh, calcification here. Do we have data uh, telling us uh, or supporting specific indications, specific uh, uh, treatment strategies? Yeah, it's, it's a very timely time to make that question um, because as you will see in the slides <coughs> I'm going to show you, um, we have now the first um, big evidence coming from a large data set. If I can, can I show some slides? A large data set um, coming from the uh, disrupt cut uh, super studies using OCT. All this data has been put together, and I believe that is the most compelling evidence we have obtained in vivo about uh, the presence of um, calcium in coronary stenosis and its modification by uh, intravascular lithotripsy. You can see that in total, there are something like 262 lesions included in this study. And uh, in this and in the, in the next slides, I'm going to show you the data that has been by obtained by grouping the lesions in lesions that have uh, up to 180 degrees of the circumference uh, of the vessel uh, with a calcific plaque with OCT, as you can see, very accurate technique to look for calcium. Then uh, from that to 270, uh, uh, 270 <coughs> degrees, uh, nearly to 360, and then circumferential 360 degree of calcium. First thing that you can see is that, you can see that uh, in all these lesions, and geography will be telling you that uh, there is a calcific plaque, but only intravascular imaging will be able to give you this information. So um, the first thing I can tell you is that the, um, in all these lesions, in the disrupt cut studies, there were no differences uh, in the procedural characteristics of the treatment. So the effects of IBL that you are going to see in the next slides on these different subgroups of lesions uh, according, according to the, the, the extent of calcification and calcific burden are not um, influenced by differences in the procedural technique. And, um, and here are the first uh, observations <coughs> that, uh, that I think that are very important. First thing is that after IVL, the minimal stent area and the degree of stent expansion observed with OCT was similar in across all these different uh, subgroups of uh, uh, calcium involvement of the arterial circumference. I think that this is important. And these two cases illustrate this. You have on the top, you have a, a typical eccentric calcium, a calcific plaque in OCT. You can see it here. Uh, and then you can see the clack, the cracks, the, the, the fractures that have been generated by the by IBL, and then a very nice stent expansion after plaque reparation. Below, you can see a circumferential calcific stenosis. Uh, again, you can see uh, fractures. Probably you can see more fractures because you have more plaque to see. Uh, that's something that is interesting. But the good thing and, and what is what matters is that the degree of stent expansion is uh, similar to the other uh, non-concentric um, st uh, calcific stenosis. And here you can see the um, visible uh, calcium fractures with OCT occur in all these different subgroups of um, vessel calcification. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, you, you see less, you see more in the 360 degrees or concentric uh, calcific plaques, but probably that's because you have more plaques to, to examine with OCT. The fact is that you see them in all, as an average, 3.2 fractures per lesion. Um, 
But what is very important, and I think that this is a very important message, is that irrespective of the number of fractures that you can see with IBL, uh, and irrespective of all these different subgroups of involvement of tertiary wall with calcium, you observe similar minimal stent area and similar degree of stent expansion after IBL uh, when you implant the stent. So that speaks, uh, Emanuele, uh, on, about the fact that probably you have a, an in-depth modification of, uh, of calcium that is, uh, you know, that is, uh, is probably uh, caused, caused by IBL and that goes beyond the degree of resolution of um, OCT. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. That was a very nice and, and a very useful overview of the available data. Um, so, Flavio, we are becoming better. We learn more and more what to do. Just to brief you on what's going on here in the chat, uh, there are some initial suggestions on doing intravascular lithotripsy, also from our colleagues. Uh, why don't you give us a, a further hint on what happened uh, during the video? Obviously, Javier has already told us, I mean, this channel we created with the balloon is not enough to expand well our stent. So we decided to definitely continue in the with the vessel preparation. You see the angiogram, uh, there is a clear asymmetric distribution. We tried with a 30 millimeters long balloon, but because we want to know exactly how long this is and whether the distal part of the second diagonal is involved or is not involved in the, in the diagonal. So we put a second wire to protect the second, uh, the, the first diagonal, which is involved in the lesion, because we decided to go with a balloon-based approach. As I said, we have a lumen, we can cross with, uh, with, with the stand, but the stand will not be well deployed. So this is the preparation of the shockwave balloon, is the 40, 12 millimeters long. It's important that we get out all the air, the connection is very intuitive. This is, of course, single use. This, this part of the system is single use. It runs on your wire, the 0.14 wire, and this is, of course, a major advantage. You see the second part of the system is connected on one edge to the generator of energy, so this is non-sterile and it will be your technician to make the connection. And the second one is sterile and plugs into the catheter. You see how easily the catheter navigates now inside the lumen of the vessel and when it plays at the, at the position we want, where we want to deliver the energy, we inflate the balloon low pressure, four to five to six atmospheres, so this will not create further damage, and we press the button and we start delivering the energy one cycle each second with a maximum of 80. And you can see how the 4.0 balloon is not totally expanded, confirming that it is a very asymmetric distribution of the calcium. When we want to go a little bit distal, we saw contrast exiting the balloon, so it's clear that the balloon was totally uh, ruptured. But an IVUS run will give you the explanation, or at least what we consider to be the explanation. You can see there at, at time seven, this kind of, uh, in this moment, you can see time seven, there is a kind of sharp uh, knife in the, in the plaque, very asymmetric, very irregular. Probably that was the cause of the balloon rupture, despite the low pressure. It's a large balloon, it's a 4.0. And so we could not complete our vessel preparation. This is in detail where you can see also the effectiveness of the treatment, because now it's clear that there are fractures in the plaque, but there are all, also these sharp uh, parts of the plaque that could damage also the, the, the balloon for expanding the stand or further therapy. So what to do now? These are uh, all excellent points. And actually there are a lot of uh, information to discuss here. Uh, I'd like to start uh, sharing the slide and um, going stepwise <coughs> because there is a lot of interest from our colleagues in the chat. The first question that is recurring here is when to use intravascular lithotripsy, especially as uh, it pertains uh, or vis-a-vis -vis other advanced plaque modification tool, for example, vis-a-vis -vis rotational aterectomy. That's a very important question and I think it's our responsibility to try to help our colleagues to place correctly these devices. So let me start from Margaret. When would you use intravascular lithotripsy? 
So I think um, the lines now are even more blurred than they were when we first got IVL because now with the data that's emerging that it's effective in eccentric as well as concentric calcium, and as we'll discuss a little bit further on, even nodular calcium, it's becoming the lines between where each device can be used are, 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 are a little more blurred. I think the true um, lesion in which we still can't use it is the truly balloon uncrossable lesions where I think rotational atherectomy is still your first choice. But I think this case is a nice example of where IVL is useful. So we have a large vessel. Uh, Flavio has created a large lumen with his initial balloon. So we would need a big bar to make any further impact on the lesion. And also it's allowed him to protect that first diagonal side branch that he's obviously a little bit worried about. He can keep his wire in the side branch. So I think this is a nice example of where IVL is very useful. Thank you, Margaret. Another question, uh, Javier, that is uh, coming from our colleagues is, uh, how would you use intravascular utotripsy balloon? What is the best way to do it? For example, one of our colleagues is asking us why you didn't start with IVL in the first place in that case. So instead of going doing first balloon predilatation and then IVL, why you didn't go with IVL right away? What is your advice on this? What is the best way to use the shockwave balloon? Yeah, I think that I will have uh, follow the same approach than, um, than Flavio performed because typically if you are unable to cross with an IVOS catheter, it is quite unlikely that you will be able to negotiate the IVL balloon. If you remember that it is, a, it is a still not a, a balloon, a conventional balloon. It's a, it's a device that has a balloon, but it is not an angioplasty balloon. Um, and, and therefore the profile is a bit larger. I think that I will have performed exactly like uh, Flavio has done using a small balloon. If I will see, you know, any, um, in, any, 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 any point that the balloon was not dilating immediately after being able to <clears throat> cross with the IVL, I will go for it. So the message in a way, in a nutshell, is I will not try to first go to large balloon dilation I will just, uh, you know, open a channel for the IVL balloon and then we'll perform plaque preparation first. That's, that would be my message. Because I believe that if you already try to go with a high pressure balloon, etc., you are already causing damage to the vessel that perhaps can be minimized if you um, increase the compliance of the, of the plaque by IVL. Actually, what Javier made, uh, Javier is a very good, uh, Flavio is a very good point. When we try to do an aggressive balloon predilatation, there is a concrete risk that we would do an extensive dissection of the vessel while IVL is exactly preventing this, this risk. Why don't you explain us a bit better how does it work, the technique, what are the pros and cons? Thank you. Perhaps uh, we can have the slide to help you on this. Yeah, we, we have three very important concepts here. We can try to expand further the lesion with a non-compliant balloon. You take a 4.5, you go 20, 24, 30 atmosphere. This might be effective, but this is not the safest way to do. Not only dissections, Emmanuel, but also coronary perforation. And in case like this, with very asymmetric distribution of the plaque, coronary rupture. And a coronary rupture in a proximal LAD is, of course, a very severe complication. We have, we have the material we need to do better. Uh, one question was, why don't go in with rotational atherectomy? Well, rotational atherectomy, it's a wonderful technique. But first, you have to change your wire. You have to put the point uh, 0.0009 wire, which is not really a very friendly one, until you get used, and even after you get used. Uh, then the rotation creates heat. The heat stimulates platelets. And of course, you have certain risk of creating some thrombosis. This is not frequent in a big vessel, but it is one of the shortcuts of the technique. Then, what you ablate, it's embolized. Of course, are microparticles, so normally are not a problem, but in small vessels, long lesions, with, in patients with impaired LV function, so with microvascular dysfunction, these might create some low flow, ST elevation, and you are in troubles. Other thing, we have a diagonal branch that we have protected, because we thought on a balloon-based technology, you cannot leave a side wire to do rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy. This might be taking us a disadvantage of the technique. Actually, you don't need to protect a side branch when you do rotational atherectomy. Being based on rotation and plaque modification and not on smashing and crushing the plaque, you will not protrude the plaque into the side branch, so it's safe to do rotational in bifurcation, but you have to get rid of the idea of putting the side wire. 
Uh, last, of course, rotational atherectomy or rotational devices in general in tortuous vessels might have complications like dissections in the distal parts of the vessel and sometimes perforation. All these can be prevented with good technique, but good technique requires experience and experience requires training. And the learning curve of rotational devices is not flat. It takes time and dedication. If we go instead to the option that we selected for this case, which is a balloon-based technology, we see that we have the wire in place. This wire is OK. You can leave your side wire, the one we put on the first diagonal, and you just push a balloon. This balloon, as Javier said, is not low profile, but we have created already an adequate lumen to navigate, and you saw how easily it went. Then you don't need to do anything else than pushing the button. There is no heat, so there is no thrombosis. There is no high pressure, so there is no risk of dissections of, or, or perforation. So it's a very, very safe alternative in large vessels like this one. So these are, Emanuele, the main differences in between a rotational and a balloon. And last, the balloon is large, so it will apply its energy in the superficial and the deep part of the plaque. Rotational will rotate according to the size of your bar. If your bar is 175, which is already quite aggressive, and your balloon was a 3.5, very likely you will not create a larger lumen than that. So in this case, rotational atherectomy would be totally useless, unless you use a huge bar, more than two millimeters, but of course, the bigger the bar, the more frequent the complications. While with the IVL, technology, you will be able to break also the deep uh, part of the calcium. This, I think, it's uh, the summary why this device is so appealing and so friendly, because you don't need practically a learning curve. If you want to know how it is uh, done, you need three components. One is the generator that I said before stays at the side of the table. And this, of course, is a single use. Uh, it's not single use. It's a single device you use each time. The second one is the connector that has a non-sterile switch that your nurse will connect to the generator. And then you have the sterile part with the button that connects two plaques to the catheter. The catheter for the coronaries is six French compatible. And as I said several times, it's, it runs along your favorite wire. The different sizes go to 2.5 to 4 millimeters, and the length of the balloon is 12 millimeters. There are other two balloons, the S4 and the M5, which are uh, designed for use in peripheral arteries. So renal arteries, subclavian, femoropopletial are also the iliacs because the last generation, the M5, goes up to 8 millimeters and the length is 60 millimeters, while the M4 is uh, 40 millimeters long. Of course, these are for peripheral use with the same technique, with the same concept. You see here how it is done. It's important to remember that the markers of the balloon do not correspond to the markers of the emitters. So you have to take this into account when you place your balloon at the desired site. Of course, you can go after a first inflation farther or closer in the vessel, but this is the right position. And you see now in the, in, in the slide, in the cartoon, you inflate the balloon, as I said before, low pressure, so low risk of dissections or vascular rupture, and you start uh, given the energy for pulses that uh, sparks uh, each second for 10 seconds, with a maximum of uh, 80 pulses for catheter. And this last cartoon shows you what I think it's a nice concept of this meeting today. In the right part of the slide, you see uh, well-distributed calcified plaques, which is concentric, 100, 360 degrees. And on the other part, we see what is the case of today, which is a totally asymmetric distribution. What this slide wants to show you is that in the more homogeneous distribution of this concentric calcified plaque, you will get, let's say, an easiest result without the need of using all the pulses, the 80 pulses of your catheter, because the distribution of the energy is homogeneous. On the left side, 
what you see is that after 60 pulses, you still don't have enough microfractures. We don't know. There is no diagnostic tool to know whether you have done or not enough microfractures, because these microfractures cannot be seen by ANJO, but either by IVUS or by OCT. You need micro OCT or autopsies. So what we advise is that in the case that we have presented today, where the distribution is so uneven and deep, you should be patient and use all your pulses until you are done. And as in our case, we had the first balloon with Raptor. So we did not complete the IVL treatment. So very likely we have to work harder. Now, I want to hear your opinion on how to proceed with this case. Thank you very much, uh, Flavio. This is indeed, for me, an eye-opener. I learned a lot from this, uh, from this slide. We should not try to escape the question uh, and um, the issue, actually, that occurred during your procedure. The IVL, IVL balloon ruptured. Is there any experience in the group here with this kind of situation? Uh, is it the case that Flavio used the balloon not correctly, or is it something that can happen? And if it happens, I mean, how to, to manage, uh, Margaret? Yeah, so I think like as Flavio nicely illustrated in his IVUS, I think that usually the balloon rupture is because you've caused modification of the calcium and you've created spurs or spicules of calcium that then cause the balloon rupture. In my experience to date, I haven't had a rupture used without actually having delivered therapy. It's usually like Flavio's case where I've delivered maybe 30, 40 pulses and then it ruptures. So I think what happens is you modify the calcium, <clears throat> it becomes spikier, I suppose, and it, it punctures the, the, the balloon. And I think as Flavio also illustrated nicely, the important thing obviously is make sure you prepare the balloon thoroughly so you don't get any air embolization down the coronary artery if you're dealing with a heavy calcium burden. I'm curious to hear uh, Javier's opinion on this, and uh, what would you do next, uh, Javier? Well, I mean, first, um, I mean, it's true that we, we had some ruptures of balloons, but that's something that doesn't come as a surprise to us because we are working in such a harsh environment. I mean, uh, this uh, type of calcium spicules are frequently in these locations, and we've seen, you know, uh, non-compliant balloons, of course, uh, punctured as well by, by these uh, but I must say that also I, I haven't seen a rupture for, for quite some time. I think that the new generation of the IBL balloon is actually more robust in terms of the of the plastic and, and probably that is, accounts for that. But so and the next thing is that of course, I mean what, what we typically do, we pay a lot of attention to uh, IBL when we are performing the delivery of energy. I'm I'm sure that we will hear more about this. And we will pay attention to the degree of expansion of the balloon, of the IBL balloon, which, you know, you typically, even when you inflate it at four atmospheres, you see how with every heat of energy, there is a, a gain in luminal uh, diameter. So I'm very curious to see the next step uh, of, the, of Flavius' cases. Thank you very much, Javi. I have a very interesting comment from Ahmed, uh, which is nicely preparing the uh, overview that uh, Margaret is going to present us shortly. This is for you, Margaret. Balloons do rupture in calcified speculated lesions like balloon grenadoplasty. This makes dissection. So I guess the mm -hmm. question here is, uh, is it safe to do IVL when we see these speckles, this calcified nodule? Are there data that you would like to share with us, uh, Margaret? And perhaps so we can have I a slide. Yeah, sure. So if we go back to the OCT um, pooled analysis uh, from Disrupt CAD the studies, Akiko Mahara did a really nice analysis looking at the nodular versus non-nodular calcium cases. So nodules are caused by fragmented calcium platelets and fibrin, which forms a mass that protrudes into the vessel lumen. And these are categorized into either healed nodules where there's a, a smooth, thick, fibrous cap over the nodule, or irregular eruptive um, calcified nodules. And what Akiko found in the, the pooled um, OCT analysis was, as I think a lot of us see clinically, that nodules were more common in the right coronary artery. But interestingly, what she also found was that most of the nodules were associated with underlying concentric calcium. So in 60% of the cases that had a nodule, 
The arc of calcium was over 270 degrees behind the nodule. Um, and then actually in, in over 90% of the cases, there was at least 180 degrees of calcium deep underneath the nodule in the vessel wall. And interestingly, when they looked at stent outcomes and they compared the nodular lesions to the non-nodular lesions, they found that the MSA, the minimal stent area, and the mean stent expansion was the same in both subsets. What this slide illustrates here is the two OCT images to the left. What they, what they found was that in 77% of cases, the nodule was able to be deformed by the IVL, resulting in concentric stent expansion. And in 23% of the cases, there was less deformation of the nodule with eccentric stent expansion, but still with adequate minimal stent area. And interestingly, in the nodular lesions, there was actually a more visible fracture and a, a higher number of fractures per lesion. Thank you very so, much. Uh... So, Flavi, uh, sorry, Emanuele, just to follow on. So, what they concluded from this was that it didn't matter whether you had nodular or non nodular calcium, you still achieved the same uh, mean stent <coughs> areas of expansion. But also, interestingly, the thinking is maybe that this is because nodules are associated with this deep arc of concentric calcium at the base of the nodule and maybe what is happening is that the IVL is actually fracturing the base calcium as well as the nodule itself allowing increased compliance for the vessel wall to accommodate the nodule as you expand your stent. Reassuring data Margaret, thank you very much. Uh, at this point I think we are quite ready to know what you did uh, next, how you solved the problem. Okay. Uh, well, it's clear we are dealing with a young lady with a single vessel with a complex lesion of the LAD. This lady could deserve a mammary artery. So we have to do a good job to be competitive with the mammary artery. We did dilate, we did use IVL, it broke, but we know it's not enough. So we took another new 412 shock wave balloon and we did the 80 the 80 pulses. And you can see what Javier was saying, the difference in between one, two, and three, how it slowly grows, how it dilates further, how we prepare better the lesion. Then we go with the, sled, with the stent, which is a little bit undersized because it's sized on the distal damage, uh, vessel, ah, the distal diameter, so it's 3.0, because we want to expand it proximally uh, to 4.0 after we make sure that the distal part of the vessel is not damaged by dissections. This is the first run after IVL, 80 pulses plus, and the stent. And you see that it is a quite good expansion of the stent, except in the proximal part where you still need to go. And we went high pressure with the 4 -0. And indeed, what you see on the right side of the uh, longitudinal reconstruction of the IVOS, it gets better, it gets bigger. But in any case, the asymmetric calcified lesion stays there. The angiographic image is quite reassuring. The, the, the side branches are patent. We think that we have done a good job and we decided to stop the procedure and plan an angiographic follow-up after one year. Actually, the body language was quite clear. You were happy. You said, stop. <laughs> we don't go any further than this. And actually, indeed, you did a good job. But then the next question is, how long, how long does it last, this good angiographic result? Do we have, in other words, long-term follow-up data reassuring us that what you achieved, Flavio, acutely stays for a long time uh, in, in such, a, in such a, a good way? We have now, uh, nowadays available the DisruptCut tree uh, data that represent the largest and the longest clinical follow-up data available in patients treated with IVL. They were recently presented at TCT meeting. You see 384 patients were followed up up to one year and they will be further followed up also for uh, two years. MACE rate. Remember, this was a very high uh, uh, patient risk profile. These were patients with uh, uh, increasing rate of diabetes, elderly patients with peripheral vascular disease, with renal failure. Nevertheless, the clinical outcome as expressed here as major adverse cardiovascular events at one year was quite good considering the baseline uh, uh, position of these patients. In addition, you see a bump at the very beginning that is self-telling. 
of the complexity of the procedure performed in these patients. So you will see in the next slides where most of this bump is coming from. Cardiac death on the left, reassuring. High risk patient population, we are in the range of 1%. TVR, less than 10%, so around 6% at one year. And myocardial infarction, up to 10.5% at one year. But most of it accrued within the first month. So it was periprocedural MI, in other words. Let's look at secondary outcomes. <coughs> All-cause mortality, 1.8%, TVF, 11%, stent thrombosis, amazingly low considering this high-risk uh, patient population, 1.1% at one year. And here we come to uh, an interesting subgroup analysis. Uh, you see that there is uh, basically no difference across different subgroups that were uh, analyzed, with the only exception of patients with longer lesion more than 25 millimeters. And you can expect that when you have the combination of heavy calcification in long lesions, you might have side branches that might occlude uh, when implanting long stents. So this is indeed an intrinsic risk factor of the patient that we have to take into account. One year TVR, no major difference across subgroups, also reassuring. <coughs> and I think that all in all, we can be quite happy with the data at our disposal, Flavio. So if you acted according to what the data are telling us, we should expect good one-year outcome in this patient. And I'm sure you have the clinical follow-up of this patient and also something more than that. <coughs> That's the reason why, Emanuele, we decided to prepare this case today because it's very important to give information on, on the... When, one year is not long term, but you know that most of the events happening after a PCI, they occur within 12 months. So the patient uh, interrupted dual antiplatelet therapy um, after 12 months. Uh, we call her and he agreed to car electively to perform an invasive assessment of the result. Can we please see the, the film so we get into the details? She came in our uh, outpatient uh, clinic. You see that there is a progression on the marginal branch, but the LED is not only patent, but looks widely open with the calcium sitting there still, but with large lumen on the LED and no impairment of the flow or no stenosis on the side branches, the first and the second diagonal, the one who is pinched in the stent, the second one is what spared because we stopped with the stent before. We did a uh, physiologic assessment just to make sure that there was nothing we could not see angiographically within the vessel. And you see that both FFR and IFR are largely negative. And despite the angiographic progression on the marginal, it's negative. This is a little bit accelerated image because it's a long run of IVUS, but you can see that the stent distal is very well expanded. There is absolutely no neointimal regrowth. And you see in between time 11 and 3 that the big mass of calcium still sat on the stent and uh, pushes it a little bit, despite the lumen is very large. And the information we get with OCT is much clearer. You see the stent struts in the distal part with a widely round shape, but at a certain point it becomes kidney shape with the part of the plaque pushing inside the lumen. So this nodule that we could not overexpand with either high pressure balloon of IVL uh, remains there. Although the, you see very well the difference in between IVUS images, the black hole where the plaque is, and the clear calcified plaque on the top right part of the proximal LED, still there after one year, but it would be with a very nicely widely patent stent with a large MLE and without any neointimal proliferation in it. So a very safe result, physiologically acceptable. It's a diffuse disease. The patient is doing great. Is under single antiplatelet therapy with, uh, I don't know if aspirin or clopidogrel. And this is the imaging you get inside the vessel, outside by angiography. It looks great, but this is what we get in. And I think this is the issue of our next discussion, um, Emanuele. If we have to do something, if we are happy with this uneven distribution of calcium and the asymmetric form of this D-shaped stent at one year of the procedure. This is really an excellent case, uh, Flavio. A great outcome in this patient. I think it's uh, high time now to address 
the many questions we received from the colleagues. Really, I have to thank everyone uh, who's uh, significantly contributing <coughs> to further highlight and discuss this important topic. Let's try to address one by one. And I'd like to start from um, Margaret again. Uh, there was one of the questions that dealt with the um, cracked <coughs> calcium arc. So in other words, this colleague was uh, uh, asking whether leaving this calcified, cracked calcium arc would be a nidus for thrombus formation. So in other words, even if we put a stent, would this put at high risk of thrombosis these patients? Do you think there are data on that? Do we need to do anything special with anti-thrombotic therapy? What are your guess on this? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. So after any calcium modification, when we fracture the calcium, does it make it a more thrombotic uh, stented lesion? It probably does, and I suppose that's borne out through the fact that TVF is higher in calcific lesions. There's a lot of data to show that uh, now. Not, um, there's not specifically very high rates of stent thrombosis, but obviously um, increased um, retreatment of the lesions compared to non-calcific lesions. Well, I, I think there is some sub-analysis data of the antiplatelet studies to show that in complex PCI, including calcific disease at longer duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, shows some benefit in terms of MACE during follow-up. So I tend to treat my calcium cases with longer duration dual antiplatelet than I do my more simple lesions. Thank you very much, Margaret. Now I have a question to Javier. Javier, one of the colleagues uh, was asking whether there is any concern to use intravascular lithotripsy within the context of patients with acute coronary syndromes. In other words, when we see thrombus, can we use IVL or cannot we use it? I mean, what's your position? Well, I mean, obviously, um, uh, First, I mean, we don't have, of course, uh, this particular point uh, dedicated studies answering that particular question. But, but what we know is, of course, that achieving, you know, optimal um, PCI in the context of an acute coronary syndrome is an important aspect of it. I think that my, my reaction from a practical perspective is that if you find someone with heavy calcification at the point of, in the middle of the night, you know, in a STEMI patient, um, you should try to, of course, obtain a good result. But if for whatever reason you find that there is extensive heavy calcification that cannot be addressed at that particular point because uh, um, you don't have the proper technology to do that or whatever, you should achieve a 3 me 3 um, perfusion and then reschedule the patient for a dedicated uh, PCI using a technology like IBL, for example, where you could achieve... Um, a good result. So there is there is no substitute. Say the 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 the, the reason that the patient comes with an acute coronary syndrome is not a reason for indulgence in terms of saying that you can achieve um, a, a suboptimal result with the stenting. I think that that's something that perhaps you know Margaret can comment as well. Yes, yeah, so I understand as well, uh, Manuelli, that there is um, actually a planned planned data uh, data collection in a study and specifically NACS. Um, because obviously the balloon is very usable in that environment for all operators who have to deal obviously with calcium increasingly in the middle of the night or on the weekend. So I think that data will be very helpful for, for clinical practice. Thank you very much. I have a technical question to uh, Flavio. Uh, there was one of the comments, actually the colleagues are so active on the chat that the list of questions is going down and I have problem to follow them. But it was, um, I think, Birgit or B Brigit. I, I'm sorry if I do not pronounce it correctly. He or she is telling us that if balloon rupture occurred is because you inflated too much, the first shockwave balloon. Because she says if you inflate up to six atmosphere instead of following the recommendation of going first at four and then a little bit at six, you would have not seen balloon rupture. So can you please explain us once and forever what is the correct technique to use this balloon when you when you are within the coronary artery. Uh, well, uh, she is right. You should start with four atmospheres and giving five to six does not create a mechanical improvement of what you get. So what you need to have, it's a good, uh, the, the balloon well opposed to the artery wall, but is the energy that does the job. 
Uh, it might be that we did it very, very quickly. It was my colleague, it was Gabriele, it was <laughs> not me, so it was not my fault. It's always someone else. But I think that this <laughs> also happened to, to Margaret and Javier, so it might happen. I mean, I think any kind of balloon, you know, you, the tires of your car can, can get a hole. So <laughs> it means that there is always something that can make a hole in your balloon. That's, uh, that's very well said. Um, another technical question, Javier, for you. Uh, is there any uh, advice on the size of balloon to pre-deal before advancing the IVL? We know that in the disrupt cut series of studies, up to 50% of lesions were pre-dilated with small balloons before advancing an IVL. Do you have a good suggestion for our colleagues and for me as well, by the way, uh, on which mm -hmm. size the balloon should have before entering the IVL balloon? As an average, we consider, you know, a small balloon, uh, two millimeters, for example, that could be, you know, something that is reasonable for a vessel that, you know, is 3.5, 4. Uh, certainly, again, the, the aim of using a balloon is to facilitate the passage of the IVL balloon. It's not to try to to, um, to dilate the lesion. I think that that's the, the message that we should send to the, to the colleagues because the evidence we are getting also from OCT and from the fact that it works in, in, in nodular eccentric lesions is that you have an in-depth modification of the structure of the calcium that makes it more plastic. And therefore, the, the chances of having a profound disruption of the, of the vessel wall decreases if you have uh, performed IBL before you know, going to the large size. And regarding the size of IBL, we always use a one-to-one -one balloon ratio. Balloon to arteriation. Very good point. Another important question to you, Flavio, which is uh, the following one. Superficial versus deep location of calcium. Does it mm. influence, in a way, the um, usage or the adoption of these or the other advanced plaque modification tools? Emanuele, you know we have been treating calcified lesions for many years, and for many years the only thing we had were balloons, then scoring or cutting, and rotablation. So, this difference in between superficial and deep came out since we have OCT, because when you have IVUS, the difference is quite difficult to tell. And since we have this option, for 30 years we have been doing our job relatively well with rot ablation. Now we know better which is the problem, because we see better with OCT, and because we have the option of going deeper in the calcium and the plaque because of the energy of IVL. Now that we know that, being myself uh, an operator with rot ablation for many years, when I see an asymmetric, very deep cal uh, calcified plaque like this, I do prefer to go with IVL. Provided that you have made uh, sufficient lumen to go with the balloon, because as uh, Javier said before, the profile is, is not that, so if you cannot cross with a 2.5, balloon, you will spoil your IVL catheter and you will need to rotate. In some cases, we may leave this for discussion later if it comes out, you might need the two systems. But the concept today is superficial calcium is very well treated with rotational devices. When you have these very asymmetric and very deep and thick calcified plaques, evidently IVL, this is what we have tried to show you today, is the easiest and the most effective and safe way to do it. It's actually interesting uh, how the questions become uh, more experienced and more uh, you know, advanced uh, by the time we go on with our discussion. And colleagues are asking very important questions. Uh, just along the line of what Flavio was just uh, discussing, uh, Margaret, one of the colleagues is asking, would you perform ad hoc intravascular utotripsy in a failed rotablator case, or let's say not a failed rotablator case, in a case where plaque modification after rotational arterectomy would not be uh, complete, would not be sufficient. Would you do that? Yes, um, and I've done that several times uh, with great effect. So I think there are undoubtedly lesions where you need multiple calcium modification devices and they often will have incremental gain in a case. So I think that's where imaging is very important. So use your first device, re-image, and make sure you've modified adequately. And if you haven't, choose another device um, and complete the job. And then there was a very, very weird question specifically to you, Margaret. I think you're the best one among us to address this. 
can we use IVL in female patients? I would, <laughs> I would say I yes. I don't see anything wrong, but it would be nice so, to hear from you if we have data on this. Yes, yeah, so it's a very interesting question. So we've known for a long time that in the presence of calcium that women do worse. So they have more procedural complications during PCI and they have more MACE during follow-up. <laughs> Um, they're obviously all in all the studies. The women tend to be older and have more CKD than the male patients. And um, we in our centre we collected some data on over 700 rotablation cases, and we compared males to females, and it was very clear there was significantly higher procedural complications in the women compared to the men, and much higher mace rates during follow-up in the women compared to the men. So really interestingly, um, from the the pooled analysis from Disrupt, there's a Substudy looking at gender comparing men to women. It's the first calcium study to show there's no difference between male and female patients. So procedural success is the same. Complications are the same in long term. Thirty inpatient and thirty day mace rates are the same between men and women after IVL therapy. So I think that's very encouraging. Uh, you know, colleagues are continuing asking questions. I think we are uh, heading the uh, end of this um, session. But before closing, allow me to give the final word to Flavio, who did a great job by selecting this case. Any final consideration from your side, Flavio? Any comment you want to convey? Well, th thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I, I think that we have shared with you very practical issues. But if I might add something, and, and Margaret mentioned this before, uh, we don't have to think that these kind of devices are there in the shelf to be used once in a while in the chronic patient, in the old patients. These devices could make the difference also in our daily practice in acute coronary syndrome. Our main mission is treating coronary syndromes in acute phase, STEMI, non-STEMI. It might happen because of the age, getting older, patients more complex, calcium is there, and PCI gets more difficult. It might be that you cannot manage to open your artery, the culprit artery, and you need to be proficient with the use of these devices. We all, the older, we need to teach the younger, and they need to, this is not a procedure for old people, very experienced. You need to train, you need to learn, but this is life-saving. So I, I would leave this as a final message, if you allow me. I would still be, uh, I would still like to think that I'm among the younger ones. You I could not still learn more. from no, you. No. But, if you are uh, here with me, you are not. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we are ready for the final remarks. Let's uh, pop up the slide. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for your proactive uh, interactions with us in the, in the chat box. You really contributed significantly to make the discussion very lively. Let's uh, try to find some point, point of consensus. Highly calcified resistance coronary stenosis benefit from advanced uh, uh, plaque modification techniques despite angiographically sufficient balloon dilatation. So let's not be overconfident when we see this balloon nicely expanded because there might be more uh, underneath. Secondly, intravascular lithotripsy, when properly used, has shown to be effective equally in uh, concentric and eccentric coronary stenosis. And we heard from uh, Margaret this recent uh, uh, sub-study in calcified nodule. Even there, there seems to be uh, uh, good, good uh, outcome data. And third, uh, and last but not least, one-year angiographic follow-up confirms uh, good clinical outcomes after intravascular lithotripsy. Actually, We've got the angel follow-up from Flavio. We've got the clinical follow-up from this Cut tree. So uh, I really think the technique is mature enough to be used in our daily clinical practice when applied in a proper way. With this, I'd like to thank very much all my colleagues, Margaret McIntaggart, Javier Scaned, Flavio Ribichini. I'd like to uh, thank uh, the sponsor, uh, Shockwave Medical, who made this possible. And I'd like to thank PCR crew who made all the logistics here and the um, technical support fantastic. Thank you very much and follow us on, uh, uh, in the next series of PCR webinar.